Everybody ready to get some paint on? Get a paint on. Hello, everybody. My name is Michael. Welcome to my studio here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. And we are going to make a painting today. We're going to make a painting by another one of my favorite artists, Juan Miro. And he was a Spanish artist that lived to the great old age of 100 and I think uh, from the late 1800s to 1983 or something around there and produced a ton of work during that period of time a ton of all sorts of different kinds of work from paintings drawings sculptures some uh, I guess participated in some animations and some films but is really known for a very very playful style of painting so Let's uh, just really quickly get, because uh, I kind of for, sometimes forget to get the whole bio stuff out of the way. So it's kind of fun just to kind of take a quick little look at who he is. Um, I'm not going to go through it all here. There is a fantastic museum in Barcelona. If you've ever been to Spain and Barcelona, I highly recommend go checking it out. You can see some of his earlier style is... Um, you know, fairly representational, and then gets more and more abstract. Um, so he explores some cubism here, and uh, then he kind of goes kind of in, into surrealism, and you see these giant sculptures, very playful kind of uh, sculptures, a little bit of architecture he collaborated with, and do we see the kind of hmm? It doesn't look like these are the paintings he's most famous for. So here's um some images that kind of show some of the wild paintings. These very, very um, abstract paintings verging on non-representational -repre non painting, right? So you have kind of on a scale, you have things that look like things. That's to represent reality, right? You're representing reality. And on the other side of things, you have things that don't represent reality, that are non-representational or non-objective painting, right? And so you have these two polar opposites, like acid and base, or base and acid, whichever one you want to, to put on either side. And then in between, there's this gray area called abstraction, right? So when you take something that's realistic looking, and then you start to kind of simplify it and change it, it becomes more and more non-representational or non-objective. And then we get a lot of these paintings that just look like circles and lines and shapes, right? And, uh, and focusing on color, right? So, and some people would even argue whatever painting that you imagine being totally realistic is still a kind of abstraction, right? Because if we, even if you take a picture of something, we're cropping things out on the edges. And so we're sort of abstracting reality in some sense, right? But that's a whole conversation for another day. So uh, let's take a look at, this is the painting that we're going to be painting today. Juan Miro's Leite from 1938. And this is a deceptively complex painting Right? I think a lot of people, when they look at this kind of art, they say, oh, my kid could do that, right? As this dismissive term that it's just really simple. There's not a lot of thinking going on here. It's pretty spontaneous. There's not a lot of uh, advanced techniques going on. And I think as we paint this painting today, we're, we'll realize that there's more to, uh, to this painting and to this entire style of painting than one might originally sort of uh, on a cursory glance see. Okay, so let's get our paint out here. So here's my box of paints. Um, I had a bit of a tech malfunction. Of course, you know, those sort of things happen right as you're about to <laughs> get started and uh, nothing... Uh, my uh, too complicated to explain, but my system was not c collaborating with me this morning or this afternoon. Again, here's this little box that I have to keep my paint, my acrylic paint, nice and wet. 
And so inside of here is just a little sponge. I put some water in there. I didn't actually fully close it properly, which is just sort of defeats the purpose of having a device like this. Um, I need to probably get another one because it's over the years, it's sort of warped and everything. But uh, here's my palette. And there are places that are totally dry. There's a little bit of paint here and there that's still a little bit wet, um, which is going to complicate things a little bit for me. Uh, but let's, um, the way that, and here's these little tabs, and I've, I've uh, got Velcro on there, so I can kind of put these in here, and here, let's see, cool red down there, warm red up here, cool blue. Okay, so I got my palette all set up, and... I've got my paints, because I'm going to need more of those where the paint has dried up. And my brushes. Right, and that's pretty much all we need. Brushes, paint, a little bit of water to clean our brushes on the occasion that we need them, but as we've seen, we don't often use a lot of water in our acrylic painting. I think that's one of the main misconceptions with acrylic paint is every single time you're dipping your brush back into the water. And why do I think people do that? I think it's probably because a lot of us learn how to paint using watercolors in, in school. And with watercolors, you need to get your brush nice and wet, dip it in the, in the water, and then rub it around inside those little cakes and it activates the paint. With acrylic paint, we don't really need to do that. Maybe if your paints are, you know, you've been painting for two or three hours and they're getting a little bit dry, excuse me, a little bit of water can help, but it's not generally advised because you use water to clean your brush and you don't want to um, clean your brush while you're painting. Otherwise you're breaking down all the little bonds that keep the color onto your, your canvas. Okay, so let's get another screen up here and we're going to start painting and drawing. We're going to draw this out onto the canvas first. And I think that's okay. Okay. So let's uh let's attack this piece of uh blank canvas. You know, it's a little bit scary seeing a white canvas like that. So the easiest thing we can do to break it up is let's just put, divide it into quarters as always. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have, it doesn't matter if the middle is right here or here or here or here or here. It's just that we know that in this area is the middle of our picture. And I'll just sort of rough guesstimate that it looks sort of like right around here is the middle of this picture. Zoom in a bit. Come on, why won't you zoom in? Oh, too much. Let's see. Um, come on. Nope. It, you just will not cooperate with me. Okay, so, oh, that's, nope. Uh, okay, whoa, a little adventure. I was trying to get it to fit nicely on the screen, but um, it's maybe, let's just crop this for now. And then will you zoom to fit? Oh, nope. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so maybe I'll bring the canvas down here so we're a little bit closer to the bottom. Um, can I hide those tools? Okay. There we go. Um, okay. So, 
what we're going to do is we've got this horizon line that is it's kind of a crooked horizon line now i'm going to suggest that we make this a little bit more crooked than it is right so let's say this horizon line is something like that personally when i see a horizon like that line like this a little crooked it drives me crazy there's something in me that kind of feels like there's something wrong or it was done incorrectly so i'm going to exaggerate this just a little bit more so that somebody when they look at it doesn't think i made a mistake they think i did it purposefully right so this is going to be my horizon line okay let's draw simplify this a little bit we've got a head up here this guy you could turn this into a happy face if you wanted I don't have to really worry about these hairs um, and then we've got this kind of teardrop form and then this hand coming up and then another one so this is going to be a little bit like the Hilma Af Klimt painting. And you know, I just realized like the way that I've I've done this that there's a little bit of a gap here or or in in his painting there was a bit of a gap. So you know, I'm going to move my horizon line down. So, you know, I'm already making a few changes in this picture. Now, obviously it's you your painting on your side, you can certainly do with it what you you want. Um In some way, I find like at this stage, if I make some changes in my in this artwork, it actually frees me up a little bit. I kind of feel like, ah, okay, well, now that it's uh, a little bit different, now I'm not so kind of tied to having to draw it exactly the way it is. So I can, I'm just going to move this hand up here. So if it's, if it's already kind of changed a bit, then um, then I already know there's no way I'm going to replicate the original. And that is, there's something kind of liberating about that. Okay. You can, again, you can see that I'm making some changes and simplifying some of these shapes. And then this little fella down here. <laughs> With these legs. Okay. So if it's a little bit confusing, before you start painting, you may want to just get an eraser and erase any lines that you feel are not helping or might be a little bit confusing including maybe this uh this first grid that we put down of course we're going to paint over the whole thing but at this you know sometimes it's just a little bit helpful just to clean up your drawing before you you tackle it Oh, there's some little shapes in here, wasn't there? Okay. So, now the question is, what, what do we do next? Like, what colors do we put on here? How do we actually make this painting? So... There's, we've seen a number of different approaches in this class to making these paintings. Um, one of which is to just attack the painting directly with color. And then another one would be to do simple washes. I'm going to suggest we do some simple washes um, for this painting to kind of get it started. And what I'm going to suggest we do is a cool yellow with a little bit of white even up here and then 
some blue down here and then some red down here so that there's going to be already some paint in these places so let's begin with the top here so i've already got some i know it's mixed up here but this is some cool yellow maybe i'll even let's move it from here to here and maybe i'll get accidentally get a little bit of this green on my brush we'll see one thing that can happen if i have paint that's already dried like this is it it can it's again if i'm scrubbing on it with my brush which is just sort of like a little scrubbing tool i can end up peeling some of this paint that was there off and then that's how you get these little tiny crusty bits that kind of start forming in your painting and they can just drive you absolutely nuts but um so and you know what i'm going to add just a wee touch of white in here and that's just going to help kind of maybe block out a little bit of my pencil lines that were there and i'm gonna i might paint over top of it again with more yellow afterwards to touch things up so this is a, it's a pretty thick coat of paint i'm putting in here And I'm being pretty sloppy here. I'm not, like you can see, I'm using a big brush. I'm not uh, being too, in fact, I, this is going to be black, so I can paint right over that. And, you know, since this is a this blue, I can paint right over that blue. And this is the whole sky. Let's just paint over a lot of this. And I'm also going to get the edges of my picture painted in here. So you can see this is not as thin of a underpainting as we've done for many of the other paintings. Right? You could you could do a a, a, a wash as we've done before. Um, but I'm just all right. I want the, this color, this yellow color is really, really bright and intense. And um, I just want, I, I, I want to try to keep it as intense as possible with another really fairly strongly thick color of, of, of yellow in here just to begin with. And I may even just decide to keep a lot of uh, of this yellow here, and I might not need to paint over any of it anyway as I go. We'll see. I mean, his the yellow he put down is a, has a little bit of white in it as well. It's not just pure cool yellow. And of course, it's it's great to, that he used a nice, cool yellow for the background because this is the background, right? And we want a cool color in the background. The other thing, if I'm painting in a little bit, this is going to allow me. You know, you can see the the I, the face is a little bit differently shaped in his original painting, so I can kind of. By painting it over, I give myself room to, to later on change the shape of that head a little bit. Okay, that's all done. Um, so let's, I'm going to do the this blue down here, and then I can even do a little bit of that in some of these areas that do need blue as well. So, and maybe just while before I, I wash off my brush, it won't hurt to do a little bit of some of the other places in the painting that also have this color. And again, look how, you know, I'm, I'm not being too careful. Some of you are like, wow, this, this guy is really sloppy, isn't he? <laughs> so...
And I'm, I'm also not saying this is exactly how he would have painted this painting. I, I honestly don't know his approach, how he would have worked on these paintings. Again, he had like a, a, a background as, you know, a, a, a more realistic painter. He would have, he went to school, he learned how to paint. So he knew all of the strategies we've been talking about so far. So just because he's painting in this abstract style doesn't mean that he's not still using many of those approaches for this painting. So I'm just going to get some, I've cleaned my brush off on a rag, and I'm just what, getting a little water on it. I need to clean it a little bit more. I do want to try to get this brush relatively clean because um, if I if I put this blue here and there's still a little bit of yellow on it, it's going to go a little bit green, right? And if I want it to go green, that's fine, but uh, probably not in this instance do I want any um, green. So the water, let's take a look at this water and this a lot of the, pretty much all of the blue in here that I see is my warm blue, this ultramarine blue. So, and that dried out. So let's put a little more on there. Wow, that was way too much. <laughs> I'm always telling my students not to put as much, put that much paint on it. And I, for whatever reason, this entire course, I've been putting lots and lots of paint on my brush. Um, so I'll just show you what I'm doing here. I'm just going to grab a little bit of white again. I'm not going to use a lot of it. Put it here. And... Mixing it into my blue. So it's... it's let me see if I can just show... Um, so you can see it's there's a difference between these. It's a little bit lighter, but I kind of like that because I want a little bit more coverage in here, and that white really kind of blocks anything else out. And I'm going to take this. Be careful about getting where there's that yellow already. I want to kind of block that out. I don't have to be perfect at in applying this, but I am going to try to go for a relatively clean line. I'm also just going to make sure I get the side of my painting there too. a little bit of music back up in there. So, you know, again, the question would be from, from people watching, like, why don't I just do one really good coat of blue? And why are we putting any white in here at all? And the answer is that I'm going to probably, in order to cover the white of the canvas, I'm probably going to need to do two coats of blue anyway. Right? Otherwise, you'll see some of the canvas showing, and, and it'll be a bit of um, the weave in the canvas. And so I'm probably going to need to to do this put two coats on anyway and adding a little bit of the white in there is just going to help that initial that first coat 
be a little bit uh, more opaque, less see-through. And then the, the, maybe the next question, but I don't understand. We're trying to cover up the white and you're putting white into the paint. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Well, um, I'm, I'm trying to cover up the white of the canvas and also some of my pencil lines and any other paint that was there. And this white paint is just adds just that little bit of extra coverage to kind of get that in the initial layer nice and and um, covered but the other thing that it's going to do is it's going to keep the so when I go to put this other blue on top of it I still I still want it to be bright and to be glowing and to be sort of full of life Whereas if I put two coats of the same dark blue, so I take a dark blue, I put it there, and I put another dark blue over top of it, that last coat of dark blue, you're combining two, it's going to be doubly dark, if that makes any sense. And I don't want it to be that dark. I still, I want this top coat of blue to have a lot of energy and life to it and not to appear too dark. So that's why I've got a little bit of white inside of it. Now again, you could you could do it and you could probably pull this painting off and it would probably save you an extra half an hour maybe. Um, but I'm trying to show you guys the, the sort of the best way possible without adding too much extra time on it. All right? So this is one of those things where people say like my kid could do that and it's like, yes, of course your kid could do it. But are they going to make something that is, you know, literally as good in terms of its overall quality than the original? And that would be virtually impossible to do, right, for a little kid to do that. Um, so let's go, where else do I need more blue? We've got blue in this arm. I also, uh, at the end of today's session, I want to show some paintings that you guys have sent in to me of, uh, by Morandi and um, uh, Emily Carr. I've got a couple of amazing uh, images that you guys have sent in. So if there are other ones, I would love to see them. Oh, you know, another reason, too, why, why I'm doing this undercoat is for this reason that I'm having right here, is the weave of the canvas um, can make it a little bit difficult to create nice, sharp lines, right? Because the weave of the canvas acts like you can almost think of it as... Uh, I have an example. I have some egg cartons around here somewhere. But the weave of the canvas goes up and down, right? This it's a fabric that's on here. And so when we put paint on top of it, the paint has to kind of go into these little valleys, right? And if you've got lots of paint on your brush, what's happening is the paint goes into the valley and each time it's scraping more and more paint off. Whereas if we do an underpainting, we're sort of filling up all of those little valleys in the weave of the painting so that our final coat, where we're trying to do something nice and sharp, um, just sort of glides over top of a smoother surface. And personally, that's the kind of painting that I really like doing. Now, there are strategies that you could use to help this. So one of the ways that when I'm making my own paintings that I, I make for, um, that I sell to people, is that I will actually, I will actually paint um, uh, gesso, which is what this actual white of the canvas is when you buy it, that they've already been prepared. 
um, I'll actually paint on there with another coat of this gesso and that will make the um, it'll help fill in all of those little valleys and then I sand it off maybe we'll, we'll do this for um, for a session here maybe I'll I'll demonstrate how that works and that just makes it it's so much easier because then the surface is like uh, like a skating rink it's super smooth and then it's a lot of fun to paint on like I personally do not particularly enjoy painting on canvases that are um, that have a really thick weave which is you know that's a totally personal decision there are artists out there who like painting on burlap right they love the texture um, the only thing if you're painting a really thick dense uh, textured surfaces you need a lot of paint because it's just every time you use your brush it's like parts of it are, are being scraped off into those little valleys of paint okay so again at this stage the painting may you may have some grave feelings about where we're going here uh, but this is you know I, I, hopefully if you've if you've painted along with me so far you've probably hopefully have have uh, uh, I've proven myself correct by the end of the session <laughs> Should be using a smaller brush for that but uh, so instead of me telling saying what I should be doing let's actually just do what I should be doing um, again I'm gonna go over this a little bit later so I'm not being too worried about making that perfect um, and you know, while I've got a bunch of blue on my brush, let's put this down, or I'm going to put it in. You don't have to do it, but I'm going to put this down right under here where there's this ultimately going to be a black or a dark shape. And that way when I do put another color over it, there'll be kind of a little bit of blue hiding underneath there, which is always kind of nice. It's always kind of nice that there's more multiple colors kind of blending for our eyes in a picture. The, the one thing I would just caution you about doing kind of thicker underpaintings is I am putting a lot of paint on the surface. And that paint can take a little bit of time to dry. So you just want to be kind of mindful of that and that, you know, is there is it is there going to be enough time for it to dry for us to finish, right? You're putting big glops of paint on there. Um, and then I'll just do quick little areas here. bit of blue and then here looking good oh you know what let's I'm gonna come back to that I think I'll do some green in there in a moment um, and I did say why don't we put a little bit of this this also, you know, doing kind of a, a first pass allows me to, you know, if I'm, I'm already kind of like putting some ideas onto the page or canvas, and I can also later on when I do do my second coat, I can kind of change my mind and I could say, well, you know what, I this is supposed to be um, blue in the or green or orange or whatever it is in the original, but now that I'm here. I could kind of change it and add a different color because I feel a different color works. 
So, I got my blues there. And I'm going to clean my brush. Actually, when I got... I think, is this my painting jar? I, I do have... You can buy a jar. I, maybe I have it for my oil paints. You can buy jars um, for cleaning your brushes that actually have like a spiral piece of wire in here that are great for you can take your brush and kind of rub it along the wires in there and it helps to clean your brush and that's that's actually fantastic. My jar is somewhere back there that I use for oil paint so it's got like a, a kind of turpentine in inside of it okay so let's paint some red in here and we're going to put a warm red in there um, so i got warm red i'm just going to steal some of this white that i had oh, a little bit of blue on there but that's okay because i may want to Paint over this later. Now the red. One thing about red, and I don't, I don't know why. If there's a chemist out there, or who knows, but the red tends to be, or at least a lot of warm reds, like cadmium reds, are really good at covering surfaces. So they, they, you don't need much, if any, white in there. They'll do a pretty good job of covering any other extra paint in there. painting this you could see that in his painting there's these kind of weird streaks of something darker under the surface and what that tells me is that there was some color maybe maybe red a darker red or something under there that he's painted over All right you see me painting over this blue kind of without much concern all right I'm just gonna do that we'll see how it changes the color we'll see if if it affects the color like I, I'm saying it, it should or will but um, So I think part of when you're making a really simple painting like this painting, part of what will sort of rescue it from being a bit of a sloppy painting that people will say, oh, my kid could do that, is by having a certain amount of precision and um, Like attention, the attention to detail becomes maybe even more important important than it might otherwise be, um, because really, because there's less there on the page or the canvas, right? So it demands that, you know, if if it was really hastily done and kind of sloppily done, then it does it really will look like a, a child actually did it. Right? But if you take your time, and especially if you're building up a couple of layers like this, it's just going to have that look that, that somebody will go like, well, it looks so simple, but it, it there's something in there that I just don't understand how it was done. Right? And then you're like, ah, so you're telling me your kid could not do it? Is that what you're saying? You can see, you know, I'm painting over a few different things here. That's just going to 
you know, it might change this color a little bit. I think these legs are, well, they're black anyway, right? So and same with these big shapes up here. So I'm just trying to hide as much of this white as possible. Again, it doesn't matter if I go over top of some of these these lines or or not, because if I do another coat, then it'll just get cleaner and cleaner and sharper and sharper. Miro is also very famous for making uh, prints and lithographs, right? So, so using printmaking. And when you're doing printmaking, you can get these really beautiful, solid, flat colors, um, which can be as much harder to do with paint. So, but I think he's, what he, he did is he probably saw the results of those prints and was like, wow, that is gorgeous. I want my paintings to have a little bit more of a printmaking quality. So he would have gone back and tried to do kind of maybe what we're doing right now, is to kind of clean them up and make them just look a little bit sharper. Which requires an extra little kind of step here and there, but the results kind of speak for themselves. So even right here, I've got a quite thick coat of yellow. Right, so there's and now I'm painting red over top of it and look it's just my paintbrush kind of just glides over the surface because I'm not having to fill in those little gaps and that's just wow that's super satisfying and this is the kind of thing that people this is why people put water in their paintbrush is that they want that kind of nice kind of flowing feeling while they're painting and really what it is, is it's not thinning the paint out to make the paint thinner and more fluid. It's going to help. It's the actual surface of the canvas is not, um, uh, is still has too much texture, right? That's what it is. It's not the paint and the amount of water and how thick or thin the paint is. It's the fact that the canvas itself is still too bumpy. Okay, let's look at this again. Let's paint this arm in. Right, I could have just painted this yellow just like I did that ball. Probably would have saved me a little bit of time, but yeah, sometimes while you're working on these things, you 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 see sort of a mistake or an opportunity, and you're like, ah. If I had only known that now, that would have saved me time. Well, that doesn't mean that this painting is a failure. It just means that you learned something along the way that you'll apply on another painting. And I'll show you a great image by one of our students here who took, who did just that, you know, made one of our paintings from uh, Emily Carr last week, and then used that to make a painting of their own that is just absolutely fantastic, fabulous work. Okay. So I'm just going to leave. All right, so you can see the difference here where I'm painting this paint onto the white, whereas this one's onto the to the yellow and this one's got a little kind of jagged edges because I'm painting directly onto this to the canvas and it's just you know there's not that undercoat to kind of make a nice smooth edge and that just is personally I find that really frustrating and then you got to do these kind of this edge work and everything slows down so all these things that sometimes people think like oh I'm just going to paint directly onto the canvas and then it ultimately ends up taking them longer to make the painting than if they had just gone straight out and tried to paint directly on it. So you can see here I'm going to try to match this up. I'm painting red in here. All right, but this is going to get covered with more, more blue later on. What else do I want to do while I'm at this stage here? I'm going to just go 
down into here, add a little bit more paint. And add a bit more or is it white in here to cover this up. Just painting right over top of other paint is just so satisfying. Nice and clean lines. Okay, anything else needing to be done here? I'm going to switch to a smaller brush. And I can even just wipe off some of this paint here rather than just this going onto the rag. I can just make use of it. Um, I've got this face here. Let's even paint some for these eyes. I'm going to paint red into this entire hand. Um, we've got So this painting, you know, could have really benefited with me prepping the, the canvas beforehand. I think ultimately that would have been probably the smarter approach. But, you know, I've never painted this painting before, and it's, that's one of the things. That, you know, as I'm, you know, learning just like you guys, right, as I... You know, I, I obviously know a lot about painting, but until you actually sit down and try to make a painting, there's only so much planning and thought that you can put into it, and then it just comes down to doing it, and then you do it, and then you see. It's the same sort of thing with, like, why do, you know, famous, or, like, Broadway, like, why does Andrew Lloyd Webber, you know, the Broadway... Um, uh, producer, writer of, of Phantom of the Opera, etc. Why would they even bother doing dress rehearsals and, you know, um, uh, the, you know, the before the show kind of goes really live, they have some kind of like the pre-shows and they test it. It's because even the great makers of, of the art that we know, you know, they, there's still problems to be worked out. Right, and you do it, and then you're like, oh, you know what? Why don't we try this instead? And then we get a totally different result. And you make ultimately, ideally, it gets better and better as it goes. So, anything else need to be done here at this stage? We've got a lot going on. Oh, I think that, well, there's some red here, too. So this just goes on nice and fine because there was yellow there already. We got less texture to fill in. Beautiful. So um, now there's I don't know what this is right, right here. Now let's uh, we're gonna paint some green in here, and then we're gonna kind of start our second round of uh, color. By that time, everything gets a chance to nicely dry. And this rag that I'm using here, you know, it's, it's, I've been using it, I think, pretty much for all the classes so far. So there's, you know, two, what, two months or whatever of 
paint built up on there and it's still working great for cleaning my brushes it's it's starting to get a little crusty as the paint is drying and it's losing a little bit of an effect this might be the last session i can use get away with painting with it but it still shows that it's uh it's done its job really well so i don't have to be throwing paper towels in the garbage one after another so let's see let's go to the original here what do we all want to do here I'm going to add so, oh yeah the green was the next one so what kind of green do we want to use i think i'm going to go for a bit of he's got a kind of a, a darker green a bit of a grassy green um well let's we could do that i was part of me is like i, I kind of i like the lemon yellow a little bit more just personally in terms of my own sense of taste um, but uh, so to to get that, we'll, we'll try to get his color in here. And if you want to change it, then you certainly are invited to do so. I've got my warm yellow, and I've got some of the warm blue. We'll mix that, and we'll put a little bit of white in here and I'm probably just gonna use a smaller brush since we don't have that big of a, a space so to do this I'm gonna take uh, some of my yellow just kind of spread that out a bit and get it in my brush and just scoop up a little bit of the blue mix this here and scoop up just a bit of white in here. And I could do a, a bit of maybe more lemon yellow over top of this. Okay, so where do we need this? This is going right up here. paint this whole thing this color and see the colors are mixing a bit which is not ideal but since I might paint black or something right over top of there it's okay um, I got down here This really does feel like a kid painted that for sure. Um, <laughs> and I think that's good for right now. Is that everything I want to do? You know, again, people looking at that like, oh, it's a different color than I thought that, that that needs to be in there. But this again is our underpainting. The, the colors, this is not the final color. It's not the final color. <laughs> okay. So now I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to paint some white on here into some of these areas and to clean things up just a little bit all right so white in here going over some of these pencil lines And 
and it, you know, again, it might seem a little bit odd to paint white onto a white part of the canvas. But generally, if you're, especially if you're using these, um, these little, uh, you know, um, canvas boards or pre-made canvases, this might not actually be the same, might not be a true white. It might have a lot of another, you know, it might be slightly off white. I can kind of clean up and get rid of any pencil lines that I don't want. So in fact, I'm just going to paint the, even though I think I'm going to go back in here with some yellow and paint that over. If there's parts of this painting that I don't like, paint a little white there and it'll just disappear. So for instance, there's these pencil lines. Let's just get rid of them right now with some white. All right. So people are like, oh my goodness. Oh no. Well, look at this. We can just make it disappear. If you if you don't care about it, then don't worry about it. It's not because I'm going to paint some yellow back over top of this. You know, maybe ideally I could have put a little bit of yellow into this paint. Pretty much made it the same as that original one, but... Okay. Oh, did I get paint on my nose? We'll see. I used to have a, one of my favorite uh, teachers at art school um, when I was when I was in art school every day at the end of class his face would just be covered with graphite and paint and um, I remember somebody went as him for Halloween speaking of Halloween coming up and it was just covered in paint because he just did not care <laughs> and it just made him a legend he was just like the end of the day he was, because he, he would just get right in there. He would come right up to your painting, stick his fingers right in your painting and move things around, touch it all, like stuff that you just thought, like, especially even if parts of your painting you were pretty happy with, he would just come in there, put his fingers, thumb right in there, mush the paint around, and he'd be, like, horrified. <laughs> stuff that, I mean, I teach painting and obviously in, in drawing and sometimes I have that urge and I just like I don't I'm just not there yet I, I think I need a few more years on me before I can get to that point <laughs> alright so all of this is just cleaning up these details and it's just going to make for so much more of a satisfying painting at the very end when all of this is kind of nice and sharp features. Okay. I think that's pretty good. Anything else I want to do in this area? Nope. Let me just, kind of, you know, since it's white, this is a pretty easy color to mix, right? So if I do forget anything, pretty easy to go back and add just a little dot here and there. And even then, sometimes it's kind of nice for people to see, like some artists, especially when you know that you can kind of hide anything, sometimes artists will deliberately leave a few little clues like that so that people can will look at it and go like oh it looks kind of like they went back and touched things up a little bit and it kind of just gives that look of oh you know I'm, I'm, I want it to look really simple 
But then I'm also going to reward somebody for getting right up close to the picture and taking a, a close look. And sometimes those are kind of almost like nods to other artists. Because, you know, when I go up and, and when I'm looking at paintings in art galleries, there's a painting on the wall, I'm often like going right up to the side. And I think sometimes security guards think I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to steal it. Because <laughs> I just I want to see what it looks like right up close, what the edges of the canvas look like, because that's where some of the secrets are. Um, oh, you know what? There's a little bit of... I'm just going to touch this up. Another way to do this this kind of a painting would be not to use a pencil at all and just to go directly in and start painting. And that's a you know if you can do that it takes a lot of uh, of courage to do that maybe a little bit of um, be a little foolhardy at times right because without kind of doing any planning with a pencil then you're you're like climbing without a rope or something right and it's, there's it's it's there's more potential of something going wrong it doesn't mean you can't pull it off i mean that's actually the way that i often paint myself um when i'm making my own paintings um but if you're beginning a little bit of drawing before can really kind of help okay um Let me see. Oh, I wanted to paint this little, uh, I don't know what this is, maybe a white cap on the water in here. And this is so much more, so satisfying being able to kind of clean up these little lines. Because this is the kind of stuff that your kid cannot do. Maybe depending if you've got like, you know, teenagers or something they might be able to do, but not your five-year-old child is not able to go and does not have the patience to go and kind of fix some of those details. Okay. Or wouldn't even think of it, doesn't really maybe see it as a problem. And not necessarily that it even is a problem. Okay, so what should we do now? Um, this green is still a little bit wet. I, uh, looking to see what is still wet here. Um, I think lay, maybe, maybe I'm going to paint some of this black so I am I'm gonna rather than you can use black there's nothing inherently wrong with black but you know what I'm gonna use some other colors on my canvas because I personally find black just to be so intense and kind of uh, just a bit of a dead color so even if you do use black I would suggest mixing in a little bit of something else maybe making it a dark dark blue or dark purple um, so just to give it a little something now I'm gonna mix one of the darker colors that I can get out of my palette which is gonna be kinda like a purple so I'm gonna take some cool red and cool blue let's just put this right here so I'm, it's super dark purple maybe I can mix it either one of these spots I'm take a little bit of cool blue in here as well and so now I got a really, really dark purple. I'm just gonna take all of this blue and smoosh it in here. So I got a super dark blue. I kind of need a little bit more paint. And I'm gonna take a little bit of the warm red or warm yellow. So we're we've got paint kind of we've got a bunch of paints, it's sort of this big mixture. And you can do can create this kind of thing in all sorts of different ways, right? You can use cool yellow, warm yellow. Um, there's not 
you know, it doesn't, there's no uh, right or wrong way of doing this. It's just what I'm, what I'm doing is taking colors that are, are far away from one another on the color wheel, mixing them together, and then that just, uh, maybe, I'll just take a second to explain. I know I've said this before, but not, this might be the first time you're watching me. So if I'm taking colors, so what I've just done is I took some cool red and some warm blue, and I mix those together, right? So I, that gets me a nice kind of purple, right? But I complicated it by taking this color and then mixing it with this color, right? So then I'm getting, it's starting to muddy up a little bit. Now I've got a bunch of these colors together, and then I added some of the warm yellow. So now I've got a bunch of these colors with this color, meaning everything is moving towards this neutral core. So everything is getting kind of darker and um, potentially more brownish. But for me, I like this way more than just a, a, a big black color. And I'm going to make a, a bunch of it here just so it will save me time of having to mix it over and over again. Take a little right by putting that yellow in there, it just went a little bit more purpley. Putting some um, yellow back in there makes it a little bit more brown. And if it's too brown, I'm just going to add a little more blue back into it. All right, so you can see nice dark color. So it's it's not black, but it is a dark color. And ooh, that's nice. So I'm going to paint it into this area. I'm going to get a smaller brush here in a second, but since I got, I was mixing it all with this brush, I might as well get as much off of my brush as possible. Okay, now I'm going to clean it all up with a smaller brush here. And now I can glide over the surface here and get much cleaner, sharper lines. And let's bring the original painting up here. Cause what are we trying to do here? Go up here. Oh, I just realized that this may be a leg. Okay, so let's attach it to this body here. That's the one thing, if you're painting somebody else's painting, especially when it's an abstract painting, it can be kind of hard to figure out what it is you're actually painting. So you can see I'm taking some liberties with with his painting here. And I encourage you to do the same. You know, the original painting is a great painting. And it's in a museum somewhere. I don't know if it's in at his museum in Barcelona. But yours doesn't have to look exactly like it. This one is going to hang in your house. And so you've got to like it. You've got to be happy with it. So what does your painting need to make you happy? And like we talked about with Emily Carr last week, sometimes the painting just takes a life of its own and it wants its own thing. And you just have to, you can try to wrestle with it, but it's generally, you're not going to win. <laughs> it's going to tell you, make you do stuff that... Um, that can drive you a little bit nuts, so. If you are trying to make paintings and you find it really hard to do detail, you're not alone. Painting detail in paintings 
is tricky and it takes time and patience and some of us don't have the steadiest hands either um, so one of uh, one technique that maybe I'll demonstrate I'm gonna have to turn the canvas here to make it easier is if I'm trying to do um, let's say painting in this area right here and I want nice sharp lines what I'll often do maybe let's just zoom right in here um, is I'll take my brush and because painting a kind of steady line like that your hand could kind of be shaking around is what I'll do is I can kind of even anchor my hand down so let's so I'm getting kind of comfortable. So my hand is resting on the surface here. And then I can take my brush and I can just take it and kind of like push it up into some of these areas. All right, so it's kind of like, it's almost in a way taking advantage of kind of the shakiness of your hand is you're just sort of like gently kind of, I don't know, burnishing it or something. Um, and that can be a way of kind of cleaning things up and uh, getting as, as close to a sharp line as possible. You know, we'll look at artists like uh, later on, like Maud Lewis, for instance, um, famous Canadian painter, uh, famous painter that is often referred to as an outsider artist uh, you know um, which is used to often to kind of describe artists who don't have a formal art training and you know if you see especially towards the end of her life like her her hands and uh, were not um, she had some some challenges physical challenges that made it difficult for her just like uh, another great painter Renoir um, to hold a paintbrush and they were able to paint uh, some I can't remember who but somebody sent me recently um, are we gonna paint there's this one I think in another Nova Scotia artist who painted with their feet or their mouth right so painting with your your hands and feeling like you're frustrated is not a good enough excuse. There's plenty of art. Like um, when I was probably a decade ago, I went and visited uh, Renoir's studio in the south of France. And there, when towards the end of his life, he had like crippling arthritis. And he had a studio assistant, like literally take his hand, his hand is all curled up and kind of slide it in here and it's like this little man in a wheelchair painting paintings like this and then you look at the paintings he made and they're these glorious big canvases and to me that's just so inspiring because I think like you know what man there is no excuse if this guy can get up and make a painting from his wheelchair and he has to have somebody help put a, a paintbrush in his hand because he can't open his own hand and he's still cranking them out like I have full use of all my limbs there's no excuse for me not to um, to take advantage of the abilities that that my body still affords me all right it's a good reminder to be grateful for, um, for for the health that I have Right, and that's an example of somebody who is will not be uh, 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 contained, you know, super determined. And that's, you know, I think such a uh, um, admirable quality in, in any person. Okay, so let's. So you can see just that kind of. It's not the cleanest painting, you know, area there I just did, but. You know, that's also another thing to kind of think about is this painting, even if it was in the Louvre in Paris or the um, Guggenheim in New York, right? People is the closest most people are ever going to get to a painting is 
like maybe like that if if they're even allowed to right they might be able to look at it like that and how long are they going to look at it they're going to look at it like this wow look at this miro painting and then they leave right it's usually between three and five seconds is how long most people look at art which is terrifying for artists <laughs> Um, but that's a good reminder that no one is ever going to look at your painting as carefully as you will, unless they're maybe a conservator or something, right? So don't allow yourself to get so worked up about, um, uh, about the details and them not being perfect. And because most people are never going to see the painting, see those details ever, ever. for time okay i think in about 20 minutes we should be completely done um what i'm going to do i'm just doing a few more of these little details inside here using up this this darker color that i'm doing i've got it. and then i'm going to Go back with my red and my blue over some of those and yellow over the background and touch that up. And then when that's done, then I'll do little details like this hair, etc. Because I was about to do some of that here and then I realized, you know what, I might want to touch this up with some yellow. And if I do really fine details, going around afterwards is going to be really tricky. So... Um, and I'll even touch up with the red first before I do this. Because usually you want to do the black at the very, very end. So, oh, let's, I got this here. And I'll also add, like, even as a viewer, it's, some, it's nice to, to look at a painting up close and see that it's not pure black. Like you, There's plenty of paintings that I've seen like in newspapers or magazines and books for decades. And then I've traveled to those places. I've, had a, I've been fortunate enough to have been able to travel and, and to look at a lot of great art in person. And what's really exciting is when you actually see those paintings in person... And you realize, like, oh, wow, this is much different than I thought it was. Like, all this this time, I had a certain kind of idea of what it looked like. And then now that I'm standing in front of it, I realize that there was, it was very different. It's, and uh, I'll repeat a story that I remember a teacher once told me. And I'm not, this is sort of my second-hand knowledge of this story but one of them uh the, the story goes that there is a or there was a group of painters here in vancouver in the 1920s that were really into abstract painting and their kind of hero was pierre mondrian the the um the famous uh swiss is he, i think he's swiss painter who painted, um, I don't think we're doing a Mondrian painting, but he painted, uh, maybe I'll bring that up real quick. Uh, so here's Mondrian's paintings. And so there was a group of, of Vancouver artists in the 20s that were big fans of his. And they started painting. They were trying to kind of paint in that style, you know, just as other artists were inspired by Cubism or Surrealism or Renaissance painting or whatever. And the way, and they, so they saw, they hadn't traveled to New York, so they only saw these paintings in books and magazines. And they decided to try to replicate them. And what ended up happening is they used tape to get nice sharp edges in their paintings. And 
uh, because they thought that's what Pierre Mondrian was doing. And it, and it turned out that he wasn't using tape at all. He had just drawn lines with a ruler and then just tried to paint them. But when they were reproduced, they looked nice and sharp, nice sharp edges. And so it turned out that those Vancouver artists were some of the very first artists to actually use tape in their paintings to create sharp edges. And they inadvertently kind of started a whole new painting uh, technique and style of painting. And then they went to New York and actually saw the, and went, oh, <laughs> he's doing these paintings totally differently than we thought they were. And um, so in, a, in, in the long run, they ended up doing something wholly original without really knowing it. They thought they were just sort of taking the technique and reproducing it. And I just think that's something to kind of keep in mind is that things look very differently in a book or a magazine or even on the computer screen. And then, so you just, you, you never really know until you see it in person. And there's no point in trying to kind of do it exactly the way you think it's to just sort of do the best you can. Because finding out how an artist actually did any of this stuff is is very, very difficult. Like artists are are known for um, hiding their technique and being very secretive about their process for all sorts of different reasons. And um, there we go. So look at that. I'm going over top of that white. My pencil lines, like they were never there. Boom. Okay. And now, if I want, I can, his original background has got a little bit of white in there. If you want that, put uh, some white in your in your paint. If you want it to be a little bit more electric, you can just do like what I'm doing and paint the the cool yellow directly onto the canvas. And you might have some areas that have a little bit of white in the yellow and there's no right or wrong way to do this. I think just doing it is right. <laughs> like if you're sitting here and you're making a painting, that is right. How you'd go about it is how you go about it. You know, it's like there's no right way to drive to the grocery store. You know, if you get there and you can, you, you manage to get home with groceries and you can make dinner for yourself and your family, that's right. <laughs> right? There's, there's no point in worrying over the correct way of doing something. That's my opinion, though. Anyway. One thing you just have to be a little bit careful of, as I'm just painting over this white line is I painted that white line and there was quite a lot of texture there. And that can be one way that you might be, that can be a little frustrating is you can kind of, it kind of gives away a place where there was some fixing and fiddling going on, so. So I find this super satisfying. Even though this is a very simple painting on the on the initial view of it, you know, the, as we might look at it, as we start to kind of tighten it up towards the end here, where we're cleaning up all these little details, it just seems to look just um, nice and and uh, uh, how do you just like just. It, it again gets that that professional quality that I think a lot of artists are looking for in their paintings, right? Like how 
how do I make it really look really good is what people might say. Well, it's, it's this sort of attention to detail. Like I'm painting a little bit of, of white back onto here and, and into these fingers. So white and yellow. The original is, is obviously a little bit different, but yeah. Okay, I feel like that the top part of the picture is getting pretty close to being done. I'm gonna actually go over here with a little bit more of this white and clean that up and make kind of bubbled out a bit there. Um, let's see, and I can even little areas that I'm not so happy with with this darker paint. I'm gonna put a little bit of white back on there. Obviously, I can fiddle with this forever, but I think just with this painting, um, what I, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of show in terms of our class is just how we can get this to be nice and clean and sharp and, and professional looking despite its simplicity. Um, okay, let's do, do this red. I think we'll jump to the red. And we'll come back. So it's a little bit of, sometimes at this stage can be, it's almost like I'm doing a, um, uh, like archival restoration or something, right? I'm taking a painting that is, um, it's maybe been, had been cracked and stained and I'm going back over it and I'm cleaning it up and getting it ready for exhibit again. Oh, nice save. <laughs> but almost dripped paint right into the middle of the picture and I got it on my hand. And like I said, all, the accidents always happen when you're closest to home, so... It's so always when you're like, ah, I'm you know, about 10 minutes away from resolving this picture where, boom, I drop something, your paintbrush right in the middle of the painting. Uh, so what's nice is I had this bit of a kind of a, a white in my red here before. Now I'm going over it with the, this pure warm red. And this pure warm red now is just glowing, right? And it's that it's it's these little techniques that we've been using throughout this class that that create those moments that if you're if you don't know these techniques and you're painting with them, that's why people sit there like I don't know why my paintings just they look kind of dead how do you get that red or how come my red isn't as bright as yours etc right um, it's because we're using these little strategies that just um, that take a little bit extra step but ultimately have a huge payoff You know, and, and this painting has like, it, again, it's, it has this very playful kind of simplicity, but he's clearly spent hours and hours really paying attention to lots of little details. And, you know, that's why it's 
a famous painting that's on display in a museum and sells millions of copies of of you know it's on umbrellas and scarves and postcards and book covers and all those kind of things so if you want your own paintings to to achieve that level of of uh, notoriety or fame then you have to put a little bit of the extra time into it and you know quite frankly a lot of artists they want their paintings to look like they were done really quickly I think I may have mentioned before Matisse is the sort of the prime example he would work on a painting for months and months and months and deliberately use techniques to keep the paint really really wet so that he could continue to work on it as if it was you know the same painting session and so people would look at it and go like wow like that's amazing you paint it looks like you painted this all in like 15 minutes like as if you were hit by some sort of like bolt of lightning from outer space that just and he wouldn't deny it but if you know a little bit about the painting process you can kind of deduce some of the the, the ways because he would mix different things into his paint and they've shown kind of like arc through like and when conservators go over those paintings like oh clearly this painting was done over like a period of like maybe a year and yet it looks like it was done super quickly because if you make a painting that was done um that looks like it was done really really quickly and it's amazing then that kind of makes you look like you're a bit of a genius right so it's the same sort of way with like high performance athletes like how does somebody hit the tennis ball like that just in the perfect place all the time well it's because they've been practicing it every day since they were six years old you know whereas you know some of us might go play tennis once a year right and we're like oh my goodness how come i never i can't hit the ball as well as venus and serena williams right well, maybe if I devoted every day, hour of my life for the next little while, I'd be able to get a little bit closer to that level of ability. Okay. So I'm getting pretty close. I've got some blue and green to do yet. And, um, you know, once you start really fiddling with a painting like this, you start to kind of think like, okay at some point i got to walk away and you know do i want to like how how perfect is perfect because clearly we could spend a long time on some of these paintings as as simple as this one is Here, we're going to turn it around. As I said, you, know, you could turn this into a smiley face to so turn the frown upside down if you wanted. Some of you may have even omitted some of the details in this painting just out of convenience or because of we ran out of room at some part in the painting. Hmm, must have had a little white on my brush here, but that's okay. Um, okay, let's uh, wash our brushes off. I'm going to get a little bit of green on here. think retire this rag it's so covered in paint I feel like I'm getting more paint on my, my brush yeah Mondrian could be Dutch that, that probably sounds right I, I can't remember 
off the top of my head and it's a quick Google search around there. Gail says this painting reminds me somewhat of BC native art. Yeah, I mean part of the the wonder uh, the wondrous quality of like the Haida and all the Coast Salish artists here on the West Coast is the kind of graphic simplicity of their imagery, right? It's there's like super high contrast between red and white and black, those being the primary colors that they used. And they just had such a nice, clean, clear way of expressing themselves visually that uh, is, is, has made their, 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 their art such a, a treasure for the rest of the world. Um, let's see. Oh, I wanted green. So let's, um, I think I'm going to mix a bit of a, a, a brighter, poppier green here. So I'm going to use some cool blue and cool yellow. Yeah, we got this green here, which is, um, and then if I paint that green onto this areas that I've reserved for it and already painted, it's going to mix like optically with this previous color and give me a really nice a, a color that's closer to what he painted. Beautiful. So if I had just painted this color previously, it would be kind of almost too neon. It would probably would not be, and I'm going to go back up here. How do I get up here? It would probably be not uh, a, a it would just be it would really stick out as as being too much too bright so having had that little bit of a of a warmer color underneath kind of just cuts a little bit of the the candy color aspect out of that paint dulls it down a little bit Feel free to turn your canvas around and around and around. You don't have to keep it all one orientation. You know, there's some people that put their canvas on an easel and it has to stay upright the whole time. And that just seems like craziness to me. It just seems like, like, uh, why would you do that to yourself? Because you have, sometimes you have to contort yourself into all sorts of weird positions in order to to reach different parts of the, the canvas. So, um, You know what? I know this is different than what he had here, so I'm just going to paint this. Let's just paint it all green. If I want to paint over top of it and make it darker, I can always do that. What else needs a touch up of? Okay, green down at the bottom. I think we're about 10 minutes away from landing. We're circling the airport here. You can see there's some, some definite di differences between his and mine. Nothing there that concerns me, though. I'm happy enough with how things have gone. I mean, here I could add a little bit of white to touch that up if I wanted, but at some point, you know, you just go, ah, I think we've got it. Most important stuff is there. If this was a commission for someone or a, a painting that was going to go in a museum or a mural for that millions of people are going to see every day and they, as they get off the tr main train station downtown or something. Obviously, I'd want to really get 
you know, do as much as humanly possible to make it. Um, but, you know, if this is just our painting that is going to live in your studio or in your kitchen, or you have to kind of say to yourself, I think it's good enough to that I can walk away from it and feel satisfied enough that I did my best, right? So... Definitely a little bit of a different quality than this one up here. I think I just had a little bit more blue up here, and I painted a little bit thicker paint than down here. But um, so maybe I will just grab a little bit more blue in here. Yeah, there we go. You know, if you're painting really, really thin, it can sometimes be a pain because you, you, it's, you'll see all those the previous layers below, and just like I just did, putting a little bit more paint on the brush, that really helped. Um, okay, blue, yellow touch-ups. And maybe a little bit more dark, and then I'm done. So, clean my green off. Is that all the green I need? Yep. So, again, I need to... I'm just going to take... I need some more warm blue on here. Don't need a lot because close to being done here. So just a little bit, a little drip in my canvas here. Touch up some of these smaller areas first. Trying to use a, a, a kind of a, a generous application of paint onto the canvas to kind of get these uh, a little bit kind of darker colors. The thinner the paint, then it's just gonna it won't be quite as uh, intense of a blue here. It'll still kind of have a bit of that wash coming through. So I'm just applying it kind of heavy on there. And you can see a little bit of the red that was under there before. And I could go over and uh, kind of get rid of that if I like, or if I don't want it there. But I don't mind it, so I'm just going to leave it. So you can see kind of the difference between these and this one that's still unfinished and up here. I'm going to rotate it around, give you right back to 
to look at while you work on yours. Just these colors are so nice together. I mean, they're it's super contrasting colors, so they're it's a really intense effect having these what people would say is bright primary colors next to one another, um, and it can be a little bit dangerous using colors like this because because they are so bright and so loud that you don't really want to use like if i was trying to paint a picture of of a family member or you know a dog or a cat with colors this bright um, it would look you know like candy like super 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 poppy and there's nothing necessarily inherently bad with that but if i wanted something to look more realistic and maybe be a little more so-called serious or um, it would be definitely the wrong palette for this. Now, having said that, I'm always open to be surprised. I'm sure there's some artists out there who's, who would hear that and say, you know what, I'm going to make a very serious painting with bright, bright primary colors. I'm going to show that guy wrong. That's awesome. If that's you, please send me an image of it and I'll show it to everybody and you know artists we're all kind of like anytime anybody tells us no or something can't be done or you shouldn't do this or that that's where a whole bunch of artists are like wait a second hold my beer i'll be right back <laughs> i'm gonna go make do exactly what he just said not to do um now this is a little this area here this is an unexpected I would say a bit of a problem in that this was obviously in a different place in his painting. So it's kind of maybe I could change that color to something else, a white or something. Um, if it drove me, if it upset me enough. And I mean, look at the, my difference here, totally different kind of shape. I could go in and change it if I wanted, but... I'm kind of getting excited to eat dinner here. <laughs> Shortly, I can hear my wife upstairs feeding her daughter and thinking, like, that's where I kind of want to be up there. And um, So we're just going to bring this to a resolution, paint a little bit some darker stuff. Oh, there was some blue I wanted to put up here. I don't know what this was. Okay. There's a few places where I want to add a little bit of yellow as a touch up. But I'm going to start uh, putting some of these. Final details. Hmm. Ah, okay, I need to mix some more colors because this paint is too dry. Whoa, big glop about to come 
You know, it's um, paint is one of those things that's kind of hard to rush. You know, it's every time I say like, ah, okay, we'll be done here in 20 minutes. I'm sure that somebody is going to invent a drinking game because like, okay, anytime he says that, you know, he's going to be here for another 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> There's no way he's. Every time I I say I'm just about done, I'm, I I feel like I've I've get further and further away. So I'm just mixing. A darker color again. Okay. I also don't think there's necessarily like if you're painting a painting and you, and you're like ah you know I'm al I was almost done and I got to put more work into it you know that's that's sometimes it's kind of nice you know it's like it's like the painting isn't ready to be done with you yet it's like meeting a friend for coffee and you're trying to extract yourself from it and that friend just is like. Uh, you know what? I, I just want to tell you this one more thing. Or, you know what? I'm having a little bit of trouble here and there. And then if you kind of get out of your own head, you're like, you know what? I think this is where I'm supposed to be right now. I just need to stop thinking about the future and what else I'm going to do. And just be present and give this painting the attention it so sorely craves. Because <laughs> I do think these things become like their own characters, their own people and personalities. And, um, you can only try to make them do what you want them to do for so long. Well, let's go back to this original here. So doing these kind of little fine details like these hairs and antennas, you know, this would is is a little tricky to do with um with this canvas and the, the amount of texture it still has. And I'm noticing on my brush there's few hairs that were you know coming out so that can be frustrating too sometimes when you're doing these little details details just seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger as you fumble around with them brushes so just to kind of get it I'm gonna take my fingers in here You see, I'm just kind of pinching the brush and kind of trying to help get it into a nice kind of point. Oh, I didn't even realize some of these are going right onto that white. Huh.
if that was a good idea or not, but I did it. Um, again, I'm just doing my own thing here a little bit because I just feel like not. I haven't looked at the original in any real close way for quite a while. Which, you know, if, if you want to, to paint the original one, you know, you can kind of take some of the things I've, I've been doing and use them, and if not, then you use whatever, you take from me whatever you like and discard the rest, right? I'm gonna clean up these eyes. You know what, there was a few more. I did want to show you guys some paintings that people have done. Um, I think I'm just going to wait till next week because my computer is sitting here. We're almost out of space, so my apologies for anybody who's been waiting to the end here. Again, like I said, the deceptively simple or complex painting, right? You know, on the face of it, it looks like, oh, this will take us 20 minutes, and we'll have a lot of time to chat and do all sorts of stuff. Then you start working on it, and you're like, whew, oh my goodness, this is... <laughs> Jackie says, I would love to try the gesso sanding approach. It would really help me both with drawing smooth pencil lines and getting clean pencil lines. Sure, well, we could try, I can't remember what we're doing next class, but uh, uh, what is it we're doing next class? Just to take a quick. Hmm. Oh, we're doing a Frida Kahlo painting next week. Yeah, maybe we'll do that. So, um... We can do that at the very beginning of class. Or maybe I can... Do I want to show something now? Ah, I can't. Hmm. We could do... We could prep it. I think we could do a pretty good little prep at the beginning of next class. We could try to fit it all in. It's usually something that is kind of a two-step process, but maybe I'll show you how to do it at the beginning of next class. If you if you really wanted to get a head start on it, what you could do is just paint your canvas white with just some more white paint. Just paint over it white, let it dry, and then next then just have a little bit of sandpaper for next week or you could sand it yourself and get it smooth. Let it dry again, sand it again until it's as smooth as a piece of paper. That's the kind of a quick and dirty explanation of what, what uh, how, you would, how you would do it. Okay, I think... Hmm... I feel like I'm got done. It pulls me back in. That's the thing with these paintings. It's like I just love working on them, and I can work on them all day and all night. But there is other things to do in life, isn't there? just touching up the parts of the painting that I just cannot live with being. And there's some other parts that I'm not happy with, but I can't live with them. So, um, maybe in here, I'm going to paint this white. So this blue in here is driving me. It looked like a mistake. 
mistake. Okay, I've got to just walk away, Michael. You just got to just say, uh, like Kenny Rogers, you got to learn to walk away, right? Okay, so thank you everybody for uh, tuning in and watching. If you, uh, before you leave, please like and subscribe to the channel. I know uh, I say it all the time, but you know, for the hundreds and hundreds of people who watch this, it was probably like 10% actually like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me. It helps the, the, the channel get more visibility and more people to find it, like the number of people who are uh, tuning in today for the very first time. Likewise, if you want to support the channel by using uh, by sending some money in as, as a donation through the PayPal link below, there's an option to do that. There's also the Super Chat function, which you can write at the very bottom of the chat. You can uh, donate money directly through YouTube. And um, sharing the, this video with your friends and family on your Facebook or Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I would also love to see your version of this painting. And we'll talk about those next week. So take a photograph of it. Send it to, to my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, the links are in the description below. Thank you, everybody, for um, painting along with me. For, and that's why I really want to see your paintings. I want to see what you guys have created. So, um, oh, I need to sign this picture here, um, as I like to do. So I'm just going to, as I, right before I, I finish, see, that's the kind of stupid stuff that you do right at the very end of the picture. Whew. Just drop it face first. <laughs> okay. Is there an, ex an extra accent on that? I can't remember. Uh, okay. So thank you, folks. Enjoy the rest of your evening, uh, wherever you may happen to be on our beautiful planet. And we will see you next class. Goodbye, everyone.